Oh, testing, one, two. All right, is everyone ready? Okay, so um, I don't really have a step-by-step -step process. I'm just going to go from up here, <laughs> which I got enough of that. So um, first of all, we're going to start out with uh, compost extracts, just because that's kind of like a first step in making a compost tea anyways. And um, it's something that's really affordable and easy to, to, to it's like an easy approach for pretty much anyone and everyone you can make it to like an extract in like roughly a minute or something like that so um, we're going to show you how to make an extract first because you don't need all this fancy equipment for an extract you can actually do it by hand the only thing you need is some sort of tea bag um, I like these ones because they're 400 microns which just basically means that we can um, we can actually allow for the organisms uh, to fully extract because the different, sorry, I don't want to yell into this thing. Uh, oh, okay, cool. It just sounds really loud coming out of my hip. <laughs> um, so the, basically 400 microns is perfect for, uh, to have the diversity, the community of microbes to be released. Um, uh, if you go any smaller than that, you might be filtering out some of the more predatory, larger organisms. So, um, like people use paint strainers, but if I recall correctly, I think it's 250. I can't remember, but I believe that some of these bags that people are using are just not allowing for some of the larger organisms to come out. Uh, and then on the other end, people have used burlap, which has a much larger whole uh, size, but the interesting thing about that is particulates are going to then make their way into your end extract. So it really depends on like, how are you going to apply your extract? Are you just going to use it as a soil drench with like a, a watering can, which we'll bring over momentarily, um, or even just, you know, pouring out of your bucket? Um, or are you going to run it through some equipment? Are you going to run it through a spray rig? Are you going to run it through your irrigation? All these things matter when you have particulates because then you're going to clog your emitters, clog your sprayers. So generally, I just use these because um, at home, I brought this. And this is what I run, run at home. It's, uh, it's basically called a Venturi fertilizer injector. Um, I purposely don't have this apart, so it might fall apart in your hands. Don't worry, you didn't break it. But I'll pass this around, and uh, if you look closely, it's got an arrow on it, which shows you the flow. And it's just got a really interesting shape that actually creates like a, a suction type of effect. So what ends up happening is you have your irrigation line connected on both both ends here, and uh, the irrigation is, is, is moving in this direction, and it creates a pool or draws on this, which you can open or close this, depending on how much you want to run or not want to run. Um, but it's really cool because you can, and of course you wouldn't have this right here. I'd actually cut the tube and place this midway and then, dro and then drop the tube, say, in my, my bucket like so. And so then it would draw, I'm sorry, from th this right here, it looks like it's like gr glowing neon or something. I was like, whoa. <laughs> it's like extra added effects. Didn't know it does that. Um, so basically, this would then draw and then uh, integrate your organisms into your irrigation, which is really cool because um, if you have a large garden or farm or composting site and you're trying to integrate your organisms by watering can, can take a lot of time. And if we have limited time, that's just it's just not feasible. So the, this is a really cool tool to uh, to apply. So if you want to check it out, you can pass it around. Um, this one. A Venturi uh, fertilizer injector, V-E-N-T-U-R-I, if I remember correctly, and um, it's really that's what we use in agriculture quite a bit when we're releasing our organisms. It's just uh, again we can get we can scale up and we can hit tons of of surface area, whether it's five acres, five hundred acres, a thousand acres, really quickly with something like that. Where by hand, I mean we've. We've applied teas, which we'll talk about in a little bit, by hand, and it takes forever, but is worth it. Um, but for to get started, though, again, we're not, we'll, we'll first focus on extracts because it's something that's affordable. Literally, you, all you need is essentially a tea bag, some quality water, which we're going to fill this up with momentarily. And um, actually, well, does someone want to volunteer and help me fill this with water for a second? All right, come on over. Um, we'll need someone to turn on and off the water, actually someone else to do that just because we don't have an on and off here so the um here we just put a filter on the end of the hose this is a carbon-based filter and yeah you're good to go um this out 
So uh, the idea is we just want to start with quality water, like we were talking about earlier. Chlorine can be evaporated, chloramine not so much. Um, here, I think it's well water, right? Anyone know of water is non -public? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So again, it varies depending. Um, carbon is, it doesn't filter out everything. That's definitely, you know, but it filters out some stuff. So again, we're, we're trying to limit our, our negative inputs into the system. So we're just starting out with as close to quality water as possible. And then again, all we'll need is a bag and not an avalanche. <laughs> and then uh, your so if you, when you make your compost, when you make your vermicompost, um, this is this is our, our source of our biology essentially. So you'd put your uh, your compost in here, which we're going to do that momentarily, and then we'll have someone wash it. And it, so the difference between an extract and a leachate really is like the the amount of vigor that you're kind of putting into the uh, into the process. If you just put this bag in the water and pull it out and let the water passively run through it, it's kind of like how rain goes through the soil and it doesn't just wash away the organisms. They adhere themselves to those soil particles um, using those natural glues. So if you just do this and pull it out, you're going to see color come out of it and you'll maybe some humics, some fulvics, some, you know, some nutrients are going to rinse out essentially, but um, the organisms are going to stay adhered to your compost. So you actually kind of want to really stimulate, uh, which we're going to show you in a second how, how to do. And we'll have two options actually. So I've got a five gallon. If someone wants to do a five gallon, does anyone want to want to make an extract too? Okay. We have one person. Did you want to make an extract, Lauren, or do you want to um, let someone else try that? Okay. Anyone else want to make an extract? All right. Come on. Okay. So actually, can you help me? Let's pull this table over a little bit. We're just going to go that way towards the time for it. And that should be good. And then this will get, you can work right there. Okay, so this is taking a little bit. Let's switch to the five gallon bucket if you want to bring it close for a second and then we'll, we'll take it back that way. So we can get the ball started on the extracts. Um, so extracts are really cool because um, they are we're not multiplying the organisms or doing anything fancy with them. We're just literally taking them off the compost and kind of making them into uh, a water based form that we can then drench into the soil and get it to go deep because it's not sticky. So if imagine with like a compost tea, it's very sticky and uh, it's great for adhering organisms to plant surfaces. But um, if you wanted to get those organisms deep into the root zone of your plant, you apply a compost tea, it might actually stick to your mulch a little bit, stick to the upper soil profile layers a little bit. It's not going to go as deep. So extracts are really cool because they have that ability to infiltrate organisms deep into your, into your system. Um, so let's get some compost out. Do you guys have local compost or? Did you tell us the difference between an extract and a tea already? Not entirely. We're mostly just talking about extracts right now, okay. but we're going to definitely get to that. Um, but you know what, while they're filling it up, I might as well, you know, go with it. So answering that, um, so the difference really is with an extract, you're just releasing the organisms into your water and that's it. You know, you have your organisms, whatever, you know, nutrients, humics, et cetera, et cetera, that are coming out of your uh, material and, and you're, you're set. Like, so if you have say a thousand, this is a way underestimate, but say you had a thousand or a million organisms in your, in your compost. Well, at the maximum, that's how many you can have in your extract. But with the compost tea, we're actually taking uh, specific foods, uh, kind of like we were talking about earlier, bacterial foods, fungal foods. So we're going to take those foods, we're going to put it in one of these bags, we're going to add the organisms, or it, it's going to extract using... No, it's fine. You can leave that right there. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so you can manually extract, but you can also use equipment to extract. So with the compost tea, I just let the... the um, the air mechanism kind of do the extraction for me generally. Um, but yeah, so with a compost tea, you're adding oxygen. Of course, you've got water and then you we're going to add foods and life. So we're allowing for the opportunity of say that 1 million, 1,000, whatever that starting point of biology that you have. Now you have significantly more 
at the end of your tea because you've allowed that you've fed them. You've created an opportunity for them to multiply. And then in that multiplication process, things get sticky. So uh, it's really cool because um, again, like, so when we go to like get trees in nurseries, um, when we grow plants from seed or when we, I mean, majority of our situations are either not necessarily sterile, but they're lacking community. And so when they're lacking the community they need, then you have a, like, in, in nature, I, I like to think of it as like, you have healthy soil in nature, it's got a complete community. You plant that seed in that community, that community covers that seed, and any new surface that grows out of that seed, it, it gets colonized by this complete community. And they, they, they're, there's literally, there's this uh, relationship. The plant is literally releasing nutrients, uh, sugars, carbohydrates, proteins, and it's feeding these organisms and enticing them essentially to form a relationship with it, whether it's protection, whether it's uh, acquiring nutrients, retaining water, etc. cetera, has all these benefits. Um, so the plant needs that, but nursery based plants and uh, a lot of our soils in general, they don't have that. So you put it in our soil, you get it from a nursery, wherever you get your plant from, if you actually were to look at the plant surfaces, there it's not gonna have community. So to have the opportunity to create a community in an adhesive format where then you can just quickly spray it onto a plant and then cover that plant entirely. So branches, stems, or, or, uh, trunks, leaves, both, you know, all sides. And of course the roots, you want to get, get these organisms everywhere. But what I like about the tea is again, it's sticky. So that means that when you spray it onto the tree, the organisms don't just roll off, that they have the opportunity to adhere to this plant surface and then start that colonization process, uh, which does a lot of cool stuff. In my experience, we took some, um, we were talking about earlier taking things. And uh, so for instance, I took some blight. Some It was it had an apple tree that was infected. My neighbor had an apple tree infected with blight. And I was like, can I get some of that blight? And they're like, <laughs> so no one ever. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, well, why? And I was like, well, cause I'm gonna cure it, but I'm gonna infect my tree first. And so we infected my apple tree. It just newly planted. It definitely stunted its growth. Um, but then after, you know, I, it was fully colonized with this blight. And I was like, ooh, that's pretty bad. Um, I, was, I sprayed my tea. And I sprayed a couple teas. And I noticed it. the blight started not just resolving, but the plant just started glowing. It was so happy. And so you're, you're, you're not just um, colonizing the plant surfaces, but in that process, there's small amounts of nutrients. So you're doing some foliar feeding as well. Um, the leaves have the capacity to consume through their leaves uh, and not just the, the, the root zone, which is pretty cool. Especially like, for instance, we actually were talking out here. I mean, I haven't tested your soil, but just looking at some of the citrus, it, we might have some slightly alkaline soil out here, which means that we might have some nutrient lockout, which then correlates to some of the lack of green in some of these leaves. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying we've tested this one for certain, so I'm not sh sure if that's the situation here. But um, those nutrients can be foliar fed with a compost tea, which is pretty cool. Um, and so kelp is, is definitely one of the, has a lot of those micronutrients that would benefit. Um, and, and it's only a temporary thing. Yes, Janelle. And also along that same train of thought, a lot of plants stop photosynthesizing over a certain temperature. So that can be a great opportunity to feed them because if they're not photosynthesizing, they're not pulling in nutrients through their roots. So it gets real hot. <laughs> it can be a great way to save your plants too. Thank you, Janelle. <laughs> yes. So, um, I have a question. Yeah. Like you know, when we are learning about like watering the plants, how should we water it and everything? I watch so many people saying, you just got to water the soil. You don't want to go around and water the leaves or the bark because that can infest it more or something. But here you are saying, we can extract the tree and spray it on, which is, you know, yeah. it makes sense. But how many times you do it or, you know, well, if I can't spray water for this whole tree, how do we justify telling people that you can spray compost tea? Yeah, well, so spraying water and spraying tea are two different things. I mean, they have similarities, but the difference, main, the main difference is the biology. So if you're just spraying water on there, remember we talked about most trees or plant surfaces are lacking in community. So you spray water on them, they're lacking the community that supports them. And then all of a sudden a bad guy organism is like, oh, extra water, thank you. Starts, you know, fun, some bad guy fungi or something starts taking over and harming your plant. But if you're spraying the good guy organisms on your plant surfaces, 
then that that water doesn't necessarily be a bad thing because you're not just adding water, but you're colonizing and protecting that plant surface, pro prohibiting molds and other diseases from from taking taking hold. Um, now, if you can't spray the whole plant, just do your best to spray as much as possible. Um, they grow, they spread. Uh, especially a lot of the bacteria are actually known to uh, move in the air and not just colonize other plants, but potentially even seed clouds, which is pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, your compost tea can have some profound localized benefits. And my, my thing is like, I want to see like whole cities covered in compost tea because <laughs> it's like, I started doing it for a second in a small farm town. We were actually spraying the city, which was so exciting. Um, but it's just because these organisms can, can ever, you go and you touch the plant and they get on you and, and in you, like we were talking about earlier. And our cities, our everything is just, it's not necessarily sterile, but it's lacking the community that, that creates that possibility for us to be healthy. And so then we're promoting opportunities for disease to run rampant, essentially. So compost teas, I'm not saying for sure, for sure, because, you know, like there's, there's some layers to it, but pretty, it's pretty, very likely that having a compost tea added to your local plant system could actually impact the biology on us and our, our localized system, which then makes everyone around us healthy, which is pretty cool. So we're almost there. We're filling this up. Um, I don't know. We're probably going to leave like a, a few inches. Yeah. Jennifer. I just I just had a question about Janelle's point about the, the temperatures, you know, because in the desert it gets obviously really, really hot very often. Yeah. And um, like my my understanding is that, you know, photosynthesis stops because the, you know, the plant's trying to stop the evapotranspiration, right, to conserve water. So if we're forcing it to do that process when it's too hot, could we be damaging the plant instead I of helping? I don't think Janelle was saying that we're forcing it to do that, right? We're just feeding it, correct? No, yeah, no. I'm just saying, like, if if part of the process of, you know, waking that tree up when it's too hot is when it wants to be a little bit more dormant, should I say, in terms of the, the photosynthesis. <clears throat> you know what I mean? Are we, yeah. are we maybe, you know, not doing it a good thing by forcing it to open up its stoma when it's not... So it's definitely a time sensitive yeah. application, That's right? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Again, I don't. I mean, I I can't speak to that. I, I don't think I, I don't, I'm not aware of. Uh, Janelle, do you know about the how compost tea if it would? Because I don't think you were insinuating that it turns on photosynthesis, correct? You're just saying you're feeding it. Yeah. Well, they are going to take uh, materials in through their stomata, but mostly I'm thinking of like plants that wouldn't normally be living here that we are growing here oh, right. they're, they're already having a hard time um so i think that little boost in feeding to get them through and help them thrive is probably worth the risk um because if they're also starving to death they're still going to die so rather have them lose a little extra water when we're adding water and nutrients back into the system than let them conserve their water but not have any food because they can't focus on size and again, so it's kind of a last stitch like rescue effort if your plants are really suffering. Definitely not something that you necessarily have to do all the time. Yeah, and then just remember all the little organisms, they're all little water vessels. So the more life you have present, the more water storage you have present, essentially. So that's another layer to it. Um, we could turn this off, please. Thank you. I have a question that's still on the same vein. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, if we're spraying tea on um, native plants like mesquite and palo verde that we're trying to establish in our yard because we're trying to, you know, bring in native plants and, and help our help our ecosystem uh, be sustainable, um, then it should help them thrive, you know, keep away the pests, but also give them a bounce of nutrients. I mean, yeah. I, I know I find it in my, in my garden, well, I started with my house plants. I had fungus gnats really bad, and I treated them with, with worm, with vermiculture compost tea. And all of my fungus gnats went away, and I, they haven't come back. I mean, and, and I've been battling them for like a year and a half. And it was just one of those, like, you know, huge light bulb moments. Yeah. And I, since then, I've gotten rid of... Um, mealy bugs and now we're in the process of seeing how it's going to do for the squash bug because i've got those 
invading because I've got like four really nicely thriving squash plants. Uh, but it seems to just like handle everything. And then in addition to get rid of, getting rid of the pests, then we're having that, that secondary boost too. It sort of beefs them up from, from the drain that the bugs were, were uh, the, the drain effect that the bugs were having on. Yeah, and then another layer to that too is, uh, so you're talking about like native plants. You could technically go out to uh, to like a, a natural site or even neighbors where say they got this amazing Palo Verde and it looks like it's doing incredible and they're not adding a bunch of chemical fertilizers or anything. You could take a small sample of, of their soil and you could essentially do an extract and then transfer those organisms. And you don't have to do an extract. You can do a direct sample put into your soil. So you like do your as little disturbance as possible to that sample. Um, but you can also make an extract or a tea using a portion of that sample. And then you're potentially, not all the organisms are gonna grow in the tea. Um, Cause they, this is, it's just not a perfect environment for entirely everybody. Uh, but there's opportunities for, um, for helping with with natives and other plant species that are doing well so that's something I, I always keep in mind too if like, I'm like oh my neighbor's got a really amazing blueberry farm i'm gonna go out there and get some samples and bring them and integrate that in those that biology into yeah, my my blueberries into your garden that's awesome yeah yeah right on. um so we have two buckets here um all right and we have two volunteers we're gonna do a quick extract and I only brought a limited amount of compost, so we're just gonna work with what we got. It's over here. Yeah, so it's in her. And so this has got like some vermicompost in it and then some a diversity of organic foods. So we've got one bag. Here, I'll hand you this one. You can take this large one and then I have a oh, small one. With extracts, there, I do have some recommended ratios for application, but truthfully, if you're just doing an extract, it's, it doesn't have to be perfect, um, which is very different from a, uh, from a tea. A tea, you want to make sure that you're, you're uh, measuring your foods coming in, because if you put like, so, like too much bacterial foods, for instance, like too many sugars, too many uh, nitrogen uh, types of, of inputs, it'll actually... So we're putting in a very specific, so this is 110 liters, um, I think per, per minute, yeah. So 110 liters per minute is going in. But say if we put in so much party food in here for the bacteria that they start actually consuming 120 liters per minute or 140 liters per minute. So they're consuming more oxygen than our pump can, can put in. All of a sudden, the tea goes anaerobic. An anaerobic situation, um, with, if it's not properly set up, because there are good guy anaerobes, but if you're not following the proper steps to, to do a good, to, to multiply good guy anaerobes, you might end up with some human pathogens. Because there's a lot of human pathogens that fall into the anaerobe type of uh, situation. Like, I think, uh, I think it was E. coli that one farm got that they were, they, they actually had their bubbler um, about, I don't know, like a foot, maybe two, because they had a big tank for a compost tea brewer. And they didn't have their bubbler all the way at the bottom. So the entire bottom of their tea was going anaerobic. And then they ended up making a bunch of people sick. And they're like, I, why, how is it you know, going anaerobic? I don't understand. <laughs> Just little things of oversight. So uh, making sure your bubbler goes all the way to the bottom and the entire uh, volume of water is being uh, oxygenated. Making sure that your, your inputs, again, you don't put too much nitrogens or sugars so that you're essentially um, not throwing too big of a party and then things get a little crazy. <laughs> Um, so that's, those are some big no-nos with comp or big important factors with compost tea, with compost extracts. Again, it's so forgiving. Um, you can put extra compost, you can put less compost. You're not adding any foods. So we're not throwing a party. <laughs> so no worries there. Furniture, your furniture is not going to get trashed. Okay. So we've got, let's see. We're just gonna do a very small amount for each of you. If you wanna measure, if you wanna put like a half, it doesn't have to be measured, but just trying to make sure that we have enough for the compost tea. Just put like a half cup in there, roughly. And I have a measuring cup if you wanna use it. And then, yeah, and then, um, and then we can put um, maybe like a cup in hers, just cause we're limited on compost. If we had more, we could definitely put more, especially in this 30 gallon. 
Because I don't. Oh, let's put a lot more than that. Sorry. Let's put a full cup. We might just have to under make our compost tea, but it'll be okay. It's a, this is mostly for example the tea when we make it we're actually not going to be able to finish it Pro, I mean we're going to be here tomorrow so we could let it sit overnight I don't know if how, how, how safe do you think my equipment is sitting out here overnight um, <laughs> but we can also put it in the garage yeah. okay okay well it's a little hard to move this once it's full of water but yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can do it okay <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Sounds good. So yeah, then we can let this brew overnight. It's still gonna not be probably because the it, it's the compost teas are very temperature uh, and 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 warm teas. So you can do either or or both. I actually when I do mine, I do a little bit of both. Um, okay, so she's got one. You got half. Okay, so. I'm just gonna, man, this is very little. So normally I put a lot more than that, but I should have brought more compost. Um, but it's it's still for just example. So what I, one thing I do is I actually, you gotta see already where the crease is. I pinch, I pinch the bag and then I actually pretty vigorously. Sorry, I'm gonna splash a little bit. We gotta get a little wet. We gotta get some compost on this. And so I'm trying to pull the water pretty, pretty hard through the compost so I can start ripping the organisms off. So right here, I'll let you try. Uh, but yeah, so what I was saying is, uh, yeah, so what vermicompost I was saying, uh, and, um, and uh, actually I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> you said shake it up. Shake it up. <laughs> but yeah, so vermicompost though is something I, I really like to include in my compost teas. Uh, again, just like we were talking about earlier, it's got the gut of the worm has so many beneficials. Uh, and so compost tea, a, a vermicompost tea, there, you can... Almost the recipes can be interchangeable to a certain extent. Um, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I want, I want this one. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> you need some extract. Come here. <laughs> yeah, you're getting it. You're getting it. I know it's hard when your jacket with the sleeves. She doesn't seem to mind though. So typically this process I would do for about a minute. Uh, and then at that point, you'll you'll notice, it's hard to see in the shade here, but it's changing color. Yeah, you can see it's kind of brown now. How are you doing over there with your color? Yeah? There you go. So some of that humic acid content is, is being released into the water. So technically speaking, an extract, uh, even a leachate, uh, can be used to treat uh, toxicity. So like, cause you're pulling out humic acids and fulvic acids and as long as you have quality compost. So look at, just like uh, Janelle was showing you earlier, that color. So if you're, if you're, you know, if that fluid coming out has that 70% cocoa color, you're going to have a humic acid. Uh, if it's like a little bit more honey colored, a little bit lighter color, you got some fulvic acid. Uh, it's basically going to be, the fulvic is kind of a build up to a humic it's not going to give you as much capacity for remediating toxicity and stuff but it still has it has some qualities uh, to do that so i don't know i'm going to keep track but i'd say it's been about a minute so yeah the, yeah the, shelf life if you were to use on that this there is no shelf life for tea or extract pretty much i mean you like you can let it sit for a few hours uh yeah extract actually can sit a little longer uh, off the top of my head, I forget the exact number. I think it's like four hours or so. But if you really want the numbers, you know, contact me. I have them written down. I think I have them written down. I put, I'd have to look through my notes. But I'd have to look through my notes. Because we're focusing on aerobic organisms. And so there's a certain amount of oxygen in the water present. But especially because we just build it up, you know, so that splashing and that kind of twisting and moving action. So we got some air in there. But what ends up happening is that air will slowly leave the system. It goes anaerobic. And then the biology shifts. Some of the or, or, uh, of the aerobic organisms go dormant or die, depending on um, the situation. And then your anaerobes start waking up. And it could be going to be a bad thing, potentially. It's going to be a bad thing, potentially. Um, yeah. Do you see any dangers with, say, leaching? Like, say you were applying this uh, in a very sandy soil that has really good... Well, so the good thing about, I mean, this the, the organisms is they're pretty good at trying to bind to things. I don't think that like there's a bunch of because this type of there's there's very little nutrients in there 
So mostly it's just you mix fulvics and biology. There's a little bit the teas and extracts. They're never really known. They're they're, they're not touted as like fertilizer because they just have low numbers. So anything that goes through the soil would be at a minute level. Um, I really wouldn't be worried about it. Do you want to add anything to that, Janelle? Uh, uh, just maybe like what you were saying earlier in that situation, if it's sandy and you're worried about losing everything, maybe stick with a tea yeah. versus an extract. Yeah. And then another thing is too, adding organic matter to that, that sand and adding biochar, which we're going to be making next, that's going to hold on to things and not allow it to leach. So um, the composting that you already are doing, the vermicomposting you could be doing, uh, and then, of course, the biochar. All these things are going to help hold things in your soil profile and not allow them down below. Really, again, I wouldn't worry about too much with this. Um, if anything, I want my organisms to go deep because they'll start creating soil aggregate structures deeper down, allowing for the roots to then follow. Um, so it's kind of a it's definitely, I, I would say it's kind of a positive thing with the teas and extracts. Now, if we're talking about some salt-based fertilizers or something, I'd, yeah, I'd be very hesitant and I'd encourage the heck out of you to get some biochar or something. And that's something I do to, uh, tell a lot of conventional growers is they can still use biochar and regenerative techniques and not still be full on regenerative, although I try to push them in that direction. Push them in that direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what's your criteria for using the extract? So when to use, so for, um, so with the extract, I pretty much, I like to, I mean, it depends on the crops too. Like if you're really trying to push your crops, like some people in agriculture are really trying to push, I've seen people almost every watering use extracts. Um, now it's not saying you have to do that, but I've, cause it's so inexpensive to do and you can hit a large, uh, you know, amount of, but it's not necessary. Um, I, t I tend to like really focus on whenever the plants are alive and growing that's when they're releasing that's basically when the kitchen's open for you know the grocery store is open and they're releasing sugars and proteins in their car they're doing their thing and that's when we want to put the organisms out because they're going to have they're, they're going to have food when they arrive so if your plant's dormant it's probably not the best time to apply um, so throughout the growing season uh, whether you're transplanting um, or you're planting some seeds, you can technically add like a tea or an extract to a seed and then dry it down and then apply your seeds so that they have like a microbial coating on them, which is pretty cool. Um, Daniel, do you do that when you um, kind of save the seeds for the next season or you do that before planting? I usually do it before planting. Uh, I mean, you could probably do that. I'm not sure how many would last on it. I'm still figuring out how to actually measure leaf surfaces which um, we're find, trying to find the right lab for that because I want to be able to document like not just uh, protozoa or not, not just a certain organism. I want to see like the complete microbial community change. Um, so with the seed surface, that's something I would actually want to measure and, and, and know for a fact. If, and, for, and, and just my, the way I think about it is I'm just like, well, if I apply it now and I'm saving it for next season, maybe some of them make it, some of them don't. Um, so I just, I prefer to, to apply it uh, or like right in the near, uh, around it's not essentially when I'm going to be planting. Um, with compost teas, it's, um, again, dur during your growing season. Um, so if you have a lot of pests, kind of uh, like Lee, right, was talking about. So you can, if you have uh, consistent pest pressures, you can do it weekly until those pest pressures lessen. Um, and with your, uh, you can do it in the spring. Uh, you can do it post-harvest. Um, you can also do it like right as the buds on, say, your fruit trees, they're starting to form, not when the flowers open, because you don't want to get the, on the flowers. It's not like it's toxic to the bees, but it, it just makes it a little challenging for them to, to get their nectar and to do, to do their, their, their pollination process. So um, getting it when it, the buds are still kind of in their growing state is really cool. You can spray it on, and then it's cool because then, I mean, as that fruit forms, you can essentially cover, you know, it, the, the, these, they, they colonize the new surfaces that are growing. And uh, I actually had one uh, client who they had uh, thrips really badly on their nectarines. And it had a lot of scar tissue on it. And they were, they wanted that grocery store in quality. They are like, I want it to look like, no, you know, perfect. And I was like, well, we need biology. I was like, look at your soil. You just have bare dirt. Um, which this tree's not super happy about mm -hmm. the fact that I can see the dirt right here, <laughs> but, um, but also, 
<laughs> but um, on top of that, the, uh, the again, their, their leaves were just lacking in, in, in the community. So we applied the teas. We, we cre- did the soil layering practices like we talked about earlier. And next season, they had grocery store quality uh, nectarines. So it's definitely something. But again, we, we applied when it was in that bud swell stage. Then we applied a couple more times throughout the growing season. Uh, and you, it's the cool thing about a compost tea is if you do it correctly, um, if you're, you know, you're making sure that your, your, your recipe is on point, um, that your adequate amount of air is going in and you smell it, your nose is like very powerful. It's like a super science tool. It really is. And so, um, I recommend smelling your tea. If it's like off putting, like really anaerobic smelling, you know, some sort of ammonia, something's going off gassing really strongly. That's not a good thing. There's something went wrong with your tea. Someone maybe threw a party, right? And um, yeah, you don't want to apply that to your plants because I've actually experimented. Uh, we, we were growing some plants. We sprayed it on them because I was like, hey, well, it was, it's an experiment. Let's see what happens. All of a sudden, these plants just went. Mrrr. And so it was super sad. Plants are dying pretty much. I was like, oh my God, they died in like 30 seconds. And um, so then we, I quickly made another tea. Although it wasn't really a full-on tea because I only brewed it for like 30 minutes, an hour maximum. But I, you know, I, I, I bubbled it, smelled good, I applied it, and then poof, back up and straight again. So um, definitely being mindful of the smells is something. So you want to, that's why I always tell people maybe in the beginning, keep your, if you're going to do, develop your own recipe, um, maybe use someone's recipe that you, is knowledgeable, that maybe has a microscope. So as a starting point, and then as kind of grow from there. If you, especially if you don't have a microscope, you add like in teaspoons or in very small quantities, and then again you kind of just use your nose as a, as a measuring tool. Um, so for 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 today, what kind of foods we have? We actually have this is what I use because I used to do like super complex teas. Like I was measuring this, I was measuring that, I was measuring this, and it took me forever to make a tea. And then of course. Um, I had to clean it. You guys are done. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you did a great job. You did a great job. <laughs> I see Prima's lack of enthusiasm. She's like, how long do I have to do this for? <laughs> no, I'm just making it better. I'm there you go. There you go. Extra love. Yeah. That vitamin L. Yeah. I have a question. Sorry. Do you want to finish what you were saying? No, go for it. Um, as part of permaculture, I learned that never plant a tree alone. That's the saddest thing we are doing to it. Mm-hmm. And I learned this technique called guild planting, where you have a nitrogen fixer, dynamic accumulator, ground cover, and everything. Yeah. So I kind of created a community around the tree, yeah. which is supporting each other. Did you do any observations with a tree that has a guild around <coughs> it, or a tree that's left alone and you sprayed this es- extract or compost tea for them and obviously the one doesn't have a company needs more but did you made any observations or do you have anything to say about that yeah so um definitely the i've been i've worked in a variety of landscapes and usually they don't just it's not like uh agriculture where they just have the same tree forever when you go into someone's garden when they have a tree they usually have a grass or like a you know some sort of complementary different plants and not in our area well, all you see is like petals and rocks or dg around a citrus tree or that is, a peach yeah so that's pretty sad um and that's definitely not how they're meant to grow um and so you're you're 100 percent right that we definitely want to focus on diversity okay so get this is like the micro micro uh the microscopic level of community, right? That's what we're focusing on here. But you want to work it all the way up. So from here to picking uh, plants that obviously are going to support a variety of bug life. And, and then, of course, a variety of from ground covers to um, to, to plants that like to grow um, via, like, maybe rhizome, like a sweet potato, right? Mm-hmm. That grow under the ground or a garlic or this or that. Uh, and then your shrubs and then your larger bushes and then your vines and your your maybe your medium standing trees and then your 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 larger main, main canopy trees so there's like nature plants in these tiered systems and it's super important to integrate all of them so yeah if you do that 
you will notice because you're creating you have you have a diversity of grocery stores, right? Uh, and then they also they a lot of the times you pick the right plants because a lot of these permaculture guilds people are really looking at plants and how they correlate, and so they're not just putting any plants together. They're really trying to pick plants that kind of complement each other. Um, yes, that's that's huge. And if you do something like that, adding a compost tea is going to definitely have profound more benefits. Uh, it's still going to have benefits to DG for sure because you're starting somewhere. You you at least have a microbial layer of community exception. Uh, excuse me, but it's it's like a good, better, best rule essentially. Like you want to get as close to best as possible, but you have to kind of work with your situation. Um, sometimes I'm not 100% in control of it. To kind of just be like, oh yeah, let's just redo your entire escape and let's just do this, this, and this. Mm-hmm. Not everyone wants that. Some people just want their plant to be a little healthier. Um, but yeah, so compost extracts. So we've pretty much, we've made the extracts so we can technically apply them. Um, here's one tool to make a compost extract, or excuse me, to apply a compost extract. It's super simple. Um, this is just a submersible pump that I got at Home Depot. Nothing fancy. Um, I actually took it apart because I wanted to make sure that when you're applying your extract that you're not filtering out the organisms or running them through something that's going to smash or destroy or something. You know, you you don't want to kill them and you don't want to remove them before applying them. You don't want them to get stuck in your pump, essentially. So um, I took this guy apart and um, the smallest holes I could find were that. And those are way bigger than 400 micron holes. I mean, if you want, you can pass it around. You can look at it. Um, but this is really easy to, to apply an extract. Uh, on top of that, we got a watering can over here, which we can use as well. Um, so I'm like, we got some babies over here. Does anyone want to apply an extract to some of these babies? Who wants to spread some vitamin L in community? <laughs> Come on, Adam. Those are the babies that's feeding them. <laughs> okay, cool. let's, uh, let's ask so who's in charge of this nursery over here and these plants? So what plants can we water and not overwater? <laughs> well, I was just looking at some of them actually dried out for today. So the ones up here in the front. Okay. Does anyone know what's in here currently? That was uh, that was by over there, right? Yeah. We probably should just dump it out and refill it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna, I'm, di- I'm gonna get a different one. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. Set that one aside. Yeah, yeah. We'll set this one aside. I'll give you another one. <laughs> So yeah, so there's a variety of ways to apply extract. Obviously, we're not using the Venturi, but um, you could run it through your irrigation. You can use something as simple as a watering can and a submersible pump. It works really well for me in my garden in the, in the beginning. Um, I actually use it now for teas, for because I literally just like an on-off. You guys have the little uh, the garden hose ends where you can turn it on and off and kind of like kind of almost make it so like your thumb is. Uh, spraying essentially, but without hurting your thumb <laughs> for like hours holding it. So I just use, yeah, I, I use that instead, and um, I can literally hit my garden really hardcore with some with some teas. So that submersible pump is awesome. I love it. Yeah. Have you experimented with deep root irrigation systems? Yeah. Deep root irrigation. So I have, um, I have worked ki- kind of, because uh, well, so one time. We had a, a plant where uh, it was a redwood tree. Was actually, I was talking about this earlier, that redwood that was with redwoods in my backyard. That You actually missed that conversation, but we had some redwoods in my backyard, and um, they essentially were suffering. We couldn't get water into them. We actually had someone come and hammer a pipe to deep root, uh, you know, just a water. Yeah, and uh, it just didn't work. I mean, the soil was just so compact. I'm pretty sure it was just running into a wall as soon as, you know, the water, the, the water didn't go anywhere. Uh, but what we did is we now we do infiltration swales pathways actually so anywhere there's a pathway in our garden it's actually an injection system mm-hmm. and so when it rains when we're cleaning compost buckets um, when we have extra teas or extracts kind of like a little bit anything that we need to kind of you know put water back into the system we dump back into these infiltration soils and the interesting thing is is that uh, when you have compaction layers the uh, the water runs sideways so you can put it here and it still hits this tree because the water is going to run sideways along those compaction layers. Um, so that's kind of my, I haven't really used a deep root injector per se. Um, technically I do sell them, but I just don't, I don't use them personally. Uh, it's not something that I've had to do. Um, the 
it seems like just applying from you know as long as you can get the soil to behave like a sponge i i i have really good abilities to i feel like get the, the organisms to go pretty deep but if your soil is not sponge like and you want to get them in deep and now then yeah a deep root injector can kind of expedite that process um so yeah i think it's a great tool in the right circumstance for sure all right, so let's start making a tea, or actually, did we, we got a watering can for you? Right there. Okay, so let's, uh, I'll we'll fill this up. Okay, so we're going to get to the teas done real quick and get out of here. Luckily, biochar happens really quickly, so. I expect it to be darker. Yeah, and so that's a good, so again, the darkness level, again, what were we talking about earlier? Yeah, so that's just a sh that's just showing that their compost isn't, and so when I make compost teas with these materials, this is not the only ingredient I use, because if I just use this, looked at it under the microscope, it was just a bunch of bacteria and nothing else. So where's the community? Um, so when we just extracted right now, technically speaking, we just extracted a bunch of bacteria, and this package is sitting dry for a very long time, so it's just, it's not going to have that diversity. But the reason I use this is because it's got like kelp meal, soybean meal, alfalfa meal, langbanite, evaporated cane uh, sugar, uh, humic acids, brewer's yeast, seaweed extracts. Uh, it's got everything measured pre for me of diversity of foods. So all I now have to measure is my fish hydrolysate. Uh, maybe a little bit of kelp if I want to add some, a little bit more humix if I want to. I usually focus on fungal foods because, again, that's what we're normally lacking is fungi. And then I'll actually use a quality casting, like a local worm casting, that's freshly harvested. I literally have it harvested in under 24 hours, and that's what I use in my teas. But I also use, um, it's a craft compost, uh, this uh, Keisha, if you guys were in Soil Palooza at all, um, she, her catalyst comp, uh, Catalyst bio amendments. They make a craft compost. They account. They do a bunch of microscopy work. They count the bacteria, the fungi, the, all the predators. Everyone is accounted for. They give you like a complete rundown essentially. That is what I use in conjunction with this plus a couple foods. This just helps me saves me a lot of time on having to measure like twenty different ingredients because um, it has like six or eight or ten already pre-added to it. So I just especially when we're working with like. We a lot of the times gardeners they don't have a lot of time. Farmers they don't have a lot of time, so they don't want to be measuring 10, 15, 20, 30 ingredients. So this I pretty much use it. I actually we started leaning away from um, their because they have a two part system. We started leading away from their their biology, which is their base, and we pro, like especially with agriculture, we're now only using their boost, which is their pre like their food sources, and then adding a couple more foods, and then bringing our own biology fresh. And so that's really how we kind of expedite this or bring the community into the, into balance. Um, so now we have an extract. Let's hurry up and make a tea because we got to get to the biochar. So uh, so let's get started. So let's. Uh, so I just want to show you this real quick. I actually um, I've made one before. Uh, it was. Oh my God, I'm forgetting the university. I think it's Oregon State University. They have a, a, a brewer kind of like diagram set up. And so basically I had all these like 45 degree turns and it made this like, I don't even know, octagon or some sort of shape. I forgot how many sides it has. But the problem with it is that every little connector has a crevice. Every crevice needs to be thoroughly clean because we're talking about microbes and any and when you're multiplying them and they're getting sticky, they create like a saran wrap kind of organic glue and then they'll live underneath it and there's no air underneath it. And then you have a potential pathogen in your future tea. So um, I hated cleaning my equipment for an hour every single because I'm like super pretty. I clean my brewer to make sure that like I can essentially eat off of it. Like I'm very pretty because I spray my food with it and I spray other people's food with it. Um, so I needed to make my job efficient. So this bubbler is really cool. We've got one, two, three, four, five crevices. This one maybe six if it gets in the water, but it's not usually submerged. So very minimal crevices. So I can clean this in like a matter of minutes, which is pretty awesome. Um, you can see it just snaps together like so. And actually I'm gonna take this off because it makes it easier to put it on. So I'm just gonna screw this on. So actually, while I'm doing this, who wants to uh, 
create the compost tea recipe for us real quick. Does anyone want to volunteer and put some ingredients in a bag? Anybody? Yeah? All right, come on over. Okay, so um, I think we said we put a cup in here, and they're saying one half cup per five gallons. So that means, um, so we got six, so three cups. So if you can put another uh, two cups of the, uh, the base, and then three cups of, of this guy, and you can put it in this bag right here. And so when I, when I use these materials, um, I try to apply it directly over the water because there's so much fine dust and stuff, it usually will just fall over the ground. So I try to get it to fall in the water. Okay, thank you, sir. How's everyone hanging in there? Food digesting? <laughs> yeah. So the um, so the the holes are on the bottom, and it creates kind of like a vortex effect, which is pretty cool. Some people buy like these 